What is hardcore? Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's this, and sometimes it's even this. It's a term that gets thrown around a lot, and video games are no exception. In fact, we've seen the rise of this weird little microgenre that's evolved to isolate and exploit some of our worst masochistic impulses, but that's not all there is to it, right? There seems to be this really specific design aesthetic that we associate with stuff like Dark Souls, Super Meat Boy, Cuphead, Darkest Dungeon, and games like that. But what if I told you that despite their reputation, these games might not be quite as intimidating as they seem to insist they are? In fact, there's only one obstacle in the way of your total dominion over Inkwell Isle, Lordran, or whatever this place is, and that is you. For a case study, let's use Cuphead as an example of this hardcore genre. Why? Well, it came out recently and I have lots of footage for it, that's why. But it also does some things well or badly, which are a useful commentary on this microgenre as a whole. Also, it will be impossible to bring up hardcore games without talking about, of course, Dark Souls. It's really the Dark Souls of hardcore games, I find. The first thing we think of when we talk about these kinds of games is, you guessed it, difficulty, and lots of it. These games are infamous for their punishing and demanding gameplay that tests even the most skilled of players. Now, unlike other kinds of games, the hardcore genre shoots for a certain kind of difficulty. Stuff like strategy and puzzle games require an understanding of the game's systems and how to manipulate them, and most platformers need you to have quick reflexes in order to get through the level unscathed. This hardcore genre though doesn't really promote that, it's much more focused on call and response memorization. One of the earliest fights in Dark Souls 1 is with the Taurus Demon, a huge Minotaur man. When you first walk into his arena, he'll do this, and probably get the jump on you if you've not faced him before. That means he's probably going to smush you into a delicious chosen undead jam. But next time you come back you'll know this is coming, and will be able to mentally prepare accordingly. In these hardcore games you're all but expected to fail the first one, two, three, ugh. You get the picture, the first few times. Rather than the game being a test of mastering the intricacies of mechanical interactions, or a deep and involved moveset, these games focus on perfecting a comparatively simple and intuitive one. Here's a boss that gave me trouble in Cuphead. Look at this early attempt versus my final one. The trick to beating him wasn't changing up my strategy or figuring out how everything worked, it was just executing the correct way to win. I'm sure you're all familiar with that cycle, and the relationship between the player and the enemies in the game. but. What you may not have considered is how skewed this relationship is in favour of one side. Yeah, Dark Souls, Cuphead, Super Meat Boy and all of these games are skewed massively in the player's favour. You get infinite tries and are pretty much not punished at all for actually dying, which means that any sufficiently determined player can brute force their way through any level, any encounter and still come out victorious eventually. The only limiting factor is your own patience, a fact circumvented in Cuphead by the look how close you were level progression gauge when you die. This is actually a really important, underrepresented part of the hardcore genre. In nearly all other games, dying means at best having to go back to your last autosave, and at worst, as is the case in some strategy games, having to do literally everything again. In Cuphead, you lose maybe two minutes of progress max whenever you die, and even in the longest of Dark Souls boss runs, they cap out at under five minutes once you've got them down. Remember those even more retro style bits in Super Meat Boy where you have lives instead of your usual infinite tries? Remember how terrible they were? Yeah, when you ran out of lives you had to do the whole level chain again, totally breaking the muscle memory rhythm the game instills in you as you repeat a single level. Which brings me onto an interesting point, the get good mentality. The idea that beating Dark Souls or in fact any other game is simply a matter of getting good enough to triumph over any challenge the game throws at you. Now, the internet being the internet, this is pretty much exclusively used to make people who are struggling with whatever game feel bad, but there is a kernel of truth nestled away within the toxicity, bear with me. When you're facing down a particularly challenging bit in any of these hardcore games, there's a certain knack to observing what's going on and learning from your mistakes, and bit by bit you try again and again, each of your attempts flow into each other as early parts become routine. Bit by bit you get better and better, more and more efficient, you start noticing and memorising the patterns and flow of gameplay until… it's over. You won. If you ask me, it's being able to get into that zen-like zone where it's just you and the game that's key to, well, getting good at games like this. Of course, 
getting players into this zone isn't quite as simple as setting up a big mean boss and making them fight it over and over again. Psychologists call this state flow, and the term was coined by, oh god, when do I even start with this name? Um, Mihaly Chizenskamali. I've got no idea. You know what? I'm not even, not even going to attempt that. Read his name. That's what he's called. I'm sorry. He defines flow state as when a person performing an activity is fully immersed in a feeling of energized focus, full involvement and enjoyment in the process of the activity. Flow state is dependent on keeping your brain occupied, but not exceeding a level of competence that you can maintain. Too much stress leads to panicking, and too little challenge means you'll get bored. This is a critical error a lot of hardcore games make. They equate difficulty with challenge. If you dump a player in at the deep end and mercilessly kill them over and over again, like a lot of old school arcade games did, then you're not going to keep players around long enough to get them to master the game and start having fun. Dark Souls is really good at this. Well, for the first half of the game at least. Going along the default path of Undeadberg up to the top bell, then down to the depths in the bottom bell before heading to Anor Londo means that each new area and boss keeps you right on the edge of your competence, slowly ratcheting things up until you're left with the final big challenge of Big Boy and Pointy Face. Once the game opens up, this nice curve kind of goes a bit all over the place and it's hard to maintain that cool flow state as a result. All of the best super hard games work like this, they're hard, but always within reach. All of this is usually reinforced at the end of a level segment with a huge dopamine releasing fanfare. Super Meat Boy is fantastic at this. These little end of level bits where you see all your past lives all running through the level at the same time is super cathartic. Meat Boy's near instant respawns and short levels are also great for ensuring you never leave the flow state due to frustration by putting you straight back into the action, which stuff like Dark Souls struggles with sometimes. You might be thinking, well duh, everyone knows about the relationship between difficulty and flow, Adam, you hack! And you'd be correct. So, how's this for a hot take? Think of your favourite game that is really good at inducing this state of flow. It might be Dark Souls, or Cuphead, or even a game that's not really part of this hardcore group, like, say, Thoth. What's one thing that all these games have in common? A super distinctive art style. Dark Souls has this neat Lovecraftian neo-gothic thing going on, Cuphead is a cool throwback to the dawn of animation back in the long, long ago before Disney had taken over everything, and Thoth has a minimalist geometric style. In order to stay in the flow state, you've got to be concentrating and engaged, not just the bits of your brain in charge of not getting squished, but also your senses. A visually appealing aesthetic serves to keep your brain ticking over, looking at the pretty colours, while the rest of your effort is focused on actually playing the game. The same goes for how the game actually controls. Try this, I want you to grab your interface device of choice, controller, keyboard, plumbers, it doesn't matter. When I show you this, stop! If you've got any experience at all with these sorts of games, you will have developed the instinctive oh shit reflex to hammer the dodge button in order to get out of trouble, which usually looks and sounds a little something like this. That's because stuff like Dark Souls has intuitive controls. Now, intuitive is a word that gets used by lazy game reviewers in place of the words good or nice a lot, but what does it actually mean? Well, intuitive means, simply, an action that is instinctual and doesn't need you to consciously think about it in order for you to do it. A real life example would be the way we can catch and grasp objects without really seeming to think about it. Even if you couldn't tell me the actual buttons you'd need to press to block, jump, attack or dodge, I bet you can still subconsciously remember the muscle movements required to do those things. This is a big area where Cuphead actually fails, using the default controller control scheme Jump, shoot, dash, and secondary fire are all assigned to the face buttons, which means you've got to perform these horrible feats of finger acrobatics that are totally distracting and usually get you killed, as well as dragging you out of that nice flow state. Switching the controls to something designed for human hands and not the Zargons from Quagulon 9 improves the play experience dramatically. Try it for yourself sometimes, the best controls are often the ones you think about the least, not just the most simple ones. Compare the new XCOM games to the old school DOS ones. And yes, I will use any available opportunity to talk about XCOM, thank you for asking. The new ones, despite having complex controls, are highly intuitive, with actions flowing seamlessly into one another, and everything having that nice feel-good level of polish. The old XCOM, on the other hand, has a lot of, well, mucking around in menus. It's really hard to get immersed in the chump slaughter experience, and I've got to spend 10 minutes fiddling around in menus before every mission. The clunk and fiddliness of this older system does allow for some cool emergent gameplay though, but more on that in a future video. So, with that knowledge in hand, what's the deal with the seeming disparity between people who, quite rightfully, say that Cuphead is really hard, and the people who say that Cuphead is actually quite easy? 
Well, I'd say it comes down to the flow state and how it can be used to master the challenges these games present. Initially, as we've already seen, a given level or boss in Cuphead is super intimidating, but by getting into the flow state, the moves the boss uses become second nature to avoid and predict instinctively, and because of how difficult the boss is, they have to be. Learned muscle memory is hard to forget, and because of how a lot of these games work, it's often the only factor that determines whether you can beat an encounter or not. Once you internalise the idea that Mr. Flamyface doing this means he's going to do this a few seconds later, then you're not going to have much trouble dodging the attack. You might wonder why I've chosen the title The Hollow Hardcore for this video. Well, that's because it's a fantastic pun, and it explains what I've been talking about this whole time. Hardcore games seem daunting and difficult. That's because they are. Like, seriously, were you expecting me not to say that? <laughs> the game deserves its reputation. I'm pretty good at Dark Souls and I die all the time because the game punishes mistakes brutally and there's a lot of opportunities to make one. However, after several attempts or several days, depending on skill level of trying to beat a part of a hardcore game and memorising all of its intricacies, stuff that would murderise a new player becomes a cinch to deal with. You've broken through the hardcore wall, revealing the hollow inside, and sadly it's impossible to fix that wall once broken. A Dark Souls boss mastered is probably always going to be pretty easy. It's why people can beat it with the, with, with the, with the DK bongos, really? That's the disconnect between people who say these hardcore games are easy and those who say they're hard. They're on either side of the hardcore difficulty wall. Internet superiority complexes don't help either, let's be honest. Hardcore game design isn't for everyone, but the lessons it teaches are universal. By making gameplay segments easy to memorise and engaging to the senses, especially if the player is expected to encounter it multiple times, you can make otherwise routine parts of your game fun and engaging. Sonic the Hedgehog does this really well, I'm sure Green Hill Zone and its millions of derivatives have been burned into the minds of anyone who owned a Sega Genesis. Cuphead's run and gun levels on the other hand are filled with random fiddly bits that aren't intuitive or predictable and are really hard to beat smoothly, which is in total contrast to most of the bosses. Similarly, even if your game is designed to be approachable, it helps to be aware of the different kinds of difficulty and challenges. Ones that punish mistakes harshly but are able to be memorised and internalised they reward persistent players, but might cause less determined people to give up and go and do something else. I think while we as gamers often talk a big game about flow and the psychology of games, there's just so much we don't know about it. And if you ask me, it's something we really could stand to pay more attention to in the future. But really, why are we getting so stressed out about game design? Why can't we just relax and go with the flow? Eh? Uh? Eh? Uh? Alright, fine. Yeah, well, my humor's lost on you people. Get out of here. Thank you.